<clears throat> okay, I think we're going to get started. And just for the people in the room, um, please be aware that the audio from the room, including like opening of chips and stuff like that, is audible. So if you want to open anything, now might be a good time. <laughs> Now might be a good time to do it before the lecture begins. <laughs> Thank you for that. So we want to begin by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tonga and Keech Nation peoples and their neighbors from north to south, the Chumash, Tataviam, Katanamuk, Serrano, Kawia. Peon Kuichum, Ahashaman, Ipai Tipai, Kumyai, and the Kechon peoples, whose ancestors ruled the region we now call Southern California for at least 9,000 years. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and elders of these communities, past and present who remain caretakers and advocates of the lands, river systems, and the waters and islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. For a more detailed land acknowledgement authored by the USC Van Hunnick Department of History, we invite you to visit their website. We'd love to know where those of you on Zoom are watching from, so if you haven't already, feel free to let us know in the chat. And if you'd like to know what indigenous ter territory you're on, um, my colleague Maya will be putting a link for that um, into the chat where you can investigate that. So my name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director of the USC Dorn Sife Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And I'm delighted to welcome you, those of you in person and those of you joining us online to the event today, our final event of the fall semester. Before we get started, just a couple of notes about the protocols for those of you watching on Zoom. Right now you're viewing a side-by-side -side of the speaker and the slides that are being shared, and I just want to let you know that you can make either window larger or smaller by dragging the line, the dividing line that's in between these two windows, in case you want to see Julie more close up or examine her slides more closely. So following Julie's talk, we're going to have plenty of time for discussion and questions. So we encourage questions and discussion here in the room and those of you on Zoom by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we'll try to get to as many questions as time permits. Um, please keep in mind that this is being recorded and we plan to make it widely available on our YouTube channel and through other means. So if you have a privacy concern, for those of you watching on Zoom, you, you can ask your question anonymously. And we'll share the chat, the Q&A, and um, everything with Julie following the lecture so she'll be able to see all of your comments. So now to introduce Today's lecture and our speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the USC Dorn Sife Center for Advanced Genocide Research, Chappelle Guerin Chair in Jewish Studies and Professor of History at USC, Wolf Gruner. Uh, thank you, Marta, as always, and Maya and Charlotte for uh, uh, kind of doing all the important work to make this event happen. And uh, first, a few words about uh, the center and the fellowships uh, for those who don't know. Both of them, the USC Dornsafe Center for Advanced Genocide Research was founded in 2014, um, and it's uh, focusing its effort on developing an innovative and especially interdisciplinary approach um, uh, in genocide studies and Holocaust studies. And we are emphasizing three areas which are uh, kind of still kind of underdeveloped. One is uh, resistance to genocide and mass violence. The second one is violence, emotion, and uh, the uh, behavioral change. And the third one is digital genocide studies. 
The center organizes a rich academic program uh, uh, throughout the academic year. We hold uh, uh, every year a conference, although next year we will have, uh, I already mentioned this in previous sessions, uh, two big international conferences at once at, uh, 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 here at USC, one on genocide studies and one on Holocaust studies. Um, we are hosting numerous fellows and uh, visiting scholars. Uh, and one of them is uh, Julie, who holds the Breslauer, Rudman, and Anderson Research Fellowship. Um, this fellowship is awarded annually to an outstanding, advanced standing PhD candidate from any discipline and from anywhere in the world. Um, uh, the only kind of requirement we pose is that uh, the student uh, uh, has an in innovative uh, approach uh, focusing on the testimonies of the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive or any other uh, of the uh, kind of uh, increasing um, uh, big resources at USC regarding uh, Holocaust and genocide studies. The fellowship enables the recipient to spend one month in residence uh, at the USC Don Self Center for Advanced Genocide Research uh, through, uh, during the academic year and one of the Perks for us is uh, the delivering of a uh, public lecture, which we will uh, witness uh, now. And the fellowship is made possible through the generosity of Gerald Breslauer, Mickey Rudman, and Tammy Anderson. And we were very happy that we uh, yesterday we had a kind of a meeting uh, where the, the fellow could meet the donors. And this is always kind of enlightening and enriching for all of us. So uh, we are very grateful uh, for the donors of this fellowship. So this year's recipient is Julie Fitzpatrick. She is a third year PhD student at Royal Holloway. And I just want to say for those who don't know the European system, that's different from the US, where you have coursework uh, before you start your research. Uh, third year in the, uh, Europe usually means you are actually almost finishing your dissertation research, just to highlight this, uh, because it's a different, uh, important distinction. She uh, is specializing uh, in the interface between Holocaust studies, gender studies, and the transdisciplinary approach of food history. And I think that's our first in this uh, field. Um, she earned her B, uh, uh, BA in history at the University of Bristol. And then uh, from there, she embarked on a uh, master uh, in history uh, at Royal Holloway, University of London, which she earned uh, with her thesis uh, entitled Eating? No, they slurp, gurgle, drink, tilt the bowls uh, to swallow the last drop. A study on hunger and the food waste of the Holocaust. And she received uh, her master's with distinction uh, for this uh, thesis. She has already presented her research um, at various conferences, both for specialist and non-specialist audiences. And I just want to highlight the Imperial War Museum uh, in London, the German Historical Institute in London, and also the Institute for Historical Research, which is a flagship uh, uh, of research in the UK. She has, and this is, uh, I'm happy to announce this, she has an article upcoming on food and pre-war migration experiences uh, at the Journal of uh, Holocaust Studies. And uh, she's also uh, in London, uh, kind of uh, a bridge between Royal Holloway and the Wiener Library. Uh, and so I'm very happy to welcome Julie Fitzpatrick and to welcome you all for, uh, uh, to listen to her talk food and class immigration experiences of German Jewish women. Julie? Good, af oh, good afternoon. Good, well, no, it is afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, firstly, I would like to extend my deepest thanks to the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research, particularly to Wolf Gruner, Martha Stroud, Maya Worrell, and Charlotte Gibbs, who have really allowed me to get the most out of my time here in LA, both academically and socially. Um, it has been a real pleasure to conduct research here, and I will leave with an even richer body of primary material behind my work. Um, to also keep the long tradition of fellows beginning their lecture with a comment on the weather, I will say that the sunshine and warmth in autumn or fall has been wonderful. I'll be returning to the traditional British weather of rain and cold temperatures this weekend, so it's been lovely to have some respite from this over the last month. So this paper today is focused on one section of my overall PhD research, 
middle-class German-Jewish women's experience of food in emigratory landscapes. I look at the experience of German-Jewish women's relationship with food in the pre-war, wartime and post-war contexts, analysing how they navigated pre-war emigration, anti-Semitic decrees, hiding spaces, ghettoisation, concentration camps, death marches, railway journeys, DP camps and post-war emigration all through the prism of food. My work at the centre has helped supplement and flesh out a number of these other chapters and I could probably talk for days about the Visual History Archive's testimonies that reference food in some capacity. But since I do not have days to talk about this, I would like to use my time today to talk about a very interesting facet to my work um, that I've spent the majority of my time here researching, uh, that of the foodways in places beyond German shores. So first things first, I would like to define what I mean by a middle class German Jew, the predominant demographic of my research. I think it is very important to emphasise that not every German Jew is middle class. There is a trend in the scholarship to generalise about German Jews as members of the bourgeoisie. Even within German Jewish commentary, there is this idea, for, for example, a number of testimonies I consulted say things along the lines of the German Jews were a privileged group or the German Jews were all middle class. That was certainly not the case, and I have been able to find a couple of VHA testimonies where the socioeconomic status is below this middle class threshold. However, the large percentage of the testimonies I have consulted, particularly of German Jews who emigrated before the war, fall into this middle class bracket, largely as a result of their wealth and connections being able to facilitate these big moves abroad. Another thing to point out is that there could be a broad spectrum of what it meant to be middle class. But for my work, to determine a survivor's class, or pre-war class at least, I look at the repetition of certain terms. Sometimes you do have survivors talk about being from a typical middle class household. Others use terms such as well-to-do or we lived comfortably. Most likely you will find repetitive reference to house staff. And according to survivor Bianca Berger, you couldn't be middle class unless you had someone. These are the sort of terms I use to determine the class position of German Jewish households. Um, and this is not to justify excluding a group of German Jews who did exist in Germany, of course, but this survivorship bias, um, I will say, um, that focusing on German Jews' middle classness has allowed some interesting and intriguing questions to be raised about how their class was a defining feature of their interaction with Holocaust and emigratory foodscapes. Middle classness was their frame of reference and it was, it was this, this culture um, it was the culture they knew, and yet this period made them confront the challenges of losing status. Um, I argue that food in its cooking, material and cultural form is a way of answering these questions. Secondly, one needs also to consider how food interplays with the Jewish facet of their identity. Food is not simply a well-recognised manifestation of Jewish culture, particularly evident through the laws of Kashrut, the rules associated with keeping a kosher home, and the many Jewish holidays that draw on food as a vessel to celebrate and commemorate them. Despite food's long associated ties with Judaism, the German Jewish example of the early and mid-20th century is an interesting case study. A question that historians of this group frequently contend with is how does one define Jewishness? This was an era of increased assimilation, secularization, and religious ambivalence. German first, Jewish second, is a recurrent sentence in survivors' testimonies. Whilst defined by the state as ethnic um, or racial, racially Jewish, this language was not always so cut and dry within German Jewish households. When it comes to food, this binary between Germanness and Jewishness is not as simple as kosher versus non-kosher. The testimonies consulted reflect this. Some come from households where mothers kept strictly kosher homes. Many did not keep kosher homes and talk about only celebrating the Jewish high holidays. As historian Marion Kaplan has revealed, Jewish families strongly exhibited traits compatible with the bourgeois ideal known as Bildung, referring to high levels of education and cultural, cultural cultivation. Many Jews' own estimation of Bildung combined German traditions with elements of traditional Jewish practices. As Kaplan writes, individuals created their own Judaism. Food, which set the tone of the household, was a way for women to both proclaim their class standing and continuing loyalties to Judaism. So if food was so central to German Jews in pre-war Germany, how does this translate into an emigratory context? Remarks about keeping kosher, celebrating Jewish high holidays, and observing the Sabbath, for example, are not absent, but certainly lack space in, in these testimonies, um, of these testimonies of these moves abroad. Instead, it was the shift from affluence to hardship that, it, that I have found to be a really defining feature of German Jewish women's experience of these journeys something revealed in their negotiation of new foodscapes and domestic work abroad. Also, I will just add, when I refer to food, I refer to food in sort of the broadest sense, from eating, cooking, domestic labour in the kitchen and grocery shopping. 
And now just to briefly contextualise and explain the landscapes that I have spent my month here researching. These geographic locations are Great Britain, the United States, Sozoa in the Dominican Republic, and Havana in Cuba. Other locations I could have chosen include Palestine, Bolivia, Argentina, Australia, Shanghai, and South Africa, among others. My choices are not representative of all the journeys taken by German Jews, but offer an insight into several of these pathways, all of, all of which the foodways of each location were unique from the others. There would be a PhD in simply looking at the experience of emigratory foodscapes across this whole transnational spectrum, but my choices reflect a selection of some of these diverse journeys. Historians Hassia Dina and Simone Sinoto have explored the transnational makeup of Jewish food and traced the function, functions and meaning, meanings food held during watershed moments in Jewish history. They emphasise that the history of the Jews, their migrations, their settlement patterns and contours of their communal lives cannot be told without food. The uprooting of a population once content in their daily life in Germany merits its own analysis. Food alone does not make their histories, but as an ever-present component to daily life, food cannot be removed from the story. My work is situated with an impressive historiography on German Jews and their status as refugees and emigres. Food, however, is largely absent in these assessments of migration, yet should be given greater clout to something consistently endured, both, both positively and negatively, throughout these journeys. Migration places an individual sense of being and belonging into a state of flux, and food can play a critical role in anchoring a migrant and enabling the creation of new preferences and subjectivities. But food can also intensify a feeling of unbelonging. Out of a total population of 680,000 German and Austrian Jews, around 400,000 managed to leave by October 1939. Those who managed to reach Britain, the United States, or other far-flung foreign shores like Cuba and Sozoa face completely novel cultural challenges, with food being high up this list. The rest of this lecture will be about German Jewish women's experience of these challenges. Through my work with the VHA and Special Collections, I will speak about the experience of domestic service and housewifery, the navigation of food novelties and shortages, and the influence of food in rebuilding life in the wartime and immediate post-war years. Furthermore, class was a contested category when the move abroad exposed many to financial hardships, smaller apartments with inadequate kitchens and acute lifestyle changes. Thus, the lecture also examines how German Jewish women's relationship to their middle class identity added a further complication to their experience of pre-war migration, something I argue is displayed to their interactions with food. So, to begin in Britain, food, specifically in its domestic form, was a major means of entering Britain legally from the late 1930s, as a result, a great number of German Jewish women applied for domestic work visas. Between 1935 and 1939, around 20,000 domestic work visas were issued to German, Austrian and Czechoslovakian Jewish women under the age of 45, although most who came were in their early 20s. Whilst these women were grateful to be safe, many found the experience challenging and at times miserable. Homesickness, anxiety for those left behind and general mistreatment contributed to these feelings. Moreover, unfamiliarity with language, cultural rituals and food customs heightened, heightened this feeling. When they arrived in Britain, beholden to an employer, they were frequently treated as lowly servants. Furthermore, a number of these women lacked culinary skills. They had either employed or grown up with house staff. Thus, whilst the domestic fear in the bourgeois German Jewish home may have been controlled by women, and many German Jewish women were housewives, often the skills required to do the more labour-intensive domestic tasks, like cooking, setting and clearing dinner tables and cleaning dishes, was not always within their remit. Their middle-classness had allowed them to pay for domestic services and enjoy good food without having to grasp the skills to produce it themselves. This status shift evidences the strong relationship class had to the German Jewish refugee experience, especially in this setting. As historian Tony Kushner has written, these women, once employers of servants, were now redefined by their employers as working class. Consulting the VHA testimonies, I found many examples of how cooking, setting tables, serving guests and cleaning dishes was a stark shock to these young German Jewish women. These domestic jobs were lifelines to many, but there was also a burden that came with these, these tasks. Marion Bardas came from a wealthy Berlin home where her mother had a maid and a cook. She was offered a domestic work permit under the pretense that she could cook. When applying, she was asked, can you cook? Marion said, I felt, my goodness, my life depends on this. I kept a straight face and said, yes, I can cook. The reality was that she could not cook, but just desperate to leave Germany, she lied. Her employers were patient and the lady of the house even helped her, helped her with the cooking. But her lack of skill meant that she was docked pay. 
she explains, the statutory income for a domestic who lived in the household was 15 shillings a week. And because I couldn't cook, they would not give me more than 10 shillings a week. Like Marianne Bardas, Marianne Rosson also arrived in England, ill-equipped to work in a kitchen. She says, if you ask me, the lady of the house got a second domestic because I couldn't cook. I didn't like this job after being coddled before. Gisela Feldman was so baffled at the prospect of cooking and running a home that she used to phone her mother to ask her how to cook certain things. These young women had enjoyed comfortable lives in Germany as members of the middle class. They had been, to quote Marion Rossen, coddled. This demonstrates how their pre-war lives as middle-class German Jewish girls had left them ill-equipped to domestic work in this emigratory context. Moreover, their limited knowledge of local cuisine was brought into sharp relief when they arrived in Britain baffled by dishes such as the humble meat pie. The previous testimonies involved girls where their host families were largely accommodating and accepted or helped them at least with their culinary flaws. However, this was not the reality for most. Trude Adler Forscher describes her first job. It wasn't a great success. We always had a maid, so I didn't know how to do things when I got there, and I got fired on my first job. I think the episode at the tea party probably brought on the instant firing. They put me in a black dress with a little white cap and, off, and asked me to offer cookies to all the guests. A wasp was following me around, and I went, go away, wasp, I have a job to do. A man came over to me and said, you poor girl, and I said, I am not a poor girl. This altercation may have been more of a linguistic issue, not understanding the gentleman's British phrase, poor girl, which doesn't mean monetarily poor, more that she was misfortunate that a wasp was tormenting her. But the issue is that True does not consider herself poor, nor really well equipped for the job, because her upbringing had not allowed her to learn all the intricacies of serving a household in this um, servile context. Class is, an is not just an implied reference in these testimonies, but one, un one strongly understood and explicitly referenced by these women. Some of the spaces these women were occupying in Britain as domestic workers was also very unfamiliar. On the other hand, some of these spaces were incredibly familiar as their hosts were from the same strata of society that they were leaving behind in Germany. This could simultaneously be a comfort and a curse. To talk briefly about the um, former, Hildegard Hoffmann gained a domestic work permit to work for, Jew for a Jewish family in what she describes as a non-prosperous neighbourhood in the east end of London. She was terribly homesick, but joining a Jewish family would be a way for her to settle, so she thought. However, soon her identity as a German Jew from a wealthy family was the cause of a lot of misery in her work as a maid. She says, The worst part of the job was the attitude that the people displayed. I was aware of that after the very first week I was there. On Shabbat, they invited their family for a dinner, and I thought, isn't it wonderful that they have the family coming for dinner, and I'm going to meet everyone, and it's going to be like my adopted family, and so forth. Well, it turned out that all I did was serve dinner and bring the plates to the kitchen. There was no time for me to sit down and eat. I wasn't included in anything. In conversations with the lady of the house, who was a Russian Jewish emigre who, before arriving in England, had spent time in Germany, Hildegard learned why she was treated in such a cold manner. The lady of the house told her, The German Jews were so utterly unacceptable. They treated them so badly. They didn't show them any hospitality. Finally, it dawned on me that the feeling that they had for, uh, for anyone that was German Jewish was all negative. The reason that they let me cover that the reason that they let me come over was to show me that a German Jew could be a real, a very menial servant. It was a kind of vengeance thing. Since I was a spoilt Jewish princess, I had never done any what I would call hard labour. And by hard labour, Hildegard is referring to the cooking and cleaning that she was now doing with the family. Hildegard's experience is possibly better understood when one understands the tensions between German Jews um, and those from Eastern Europe, known amongst German Jews by the pejorative term Ustjuden. Earlier immigration had seen Jews from Eastern Europe settle in the east end of London, where they spoke Yiddish, were active in the labour market and identified as working class. Tensions between the Ustjuden and German Jews had existed in Germany and thus seemed to also be a feature in London. Um, and in New York, German Jews avoided the lower east side of Manhattan for similar reasons. The East End is a place for, of complete contrast to their lives in Germany, also features in Gerda Wadlinger's testimony. She says, I had read Charles Dickens, but I was not prepared that Dickens' descriptions of London slums was too good. I ended up in a place called Hoxton, Shoreditch. Toilets were in the backyard, the language had no connection to English whatsoever. Water, not water. In her German hometown, she had been sent to a school to learn to cook. And she says, these, these were all the wit... These were all women who had, had maids and cooked, cooks and so on, and they were going to become cooks. 
In retrospect, I think it was hysterical. I wish someone would, could write a sketch about it. The interviewer points out how differences in class led to these different experiences, which Gerda agrees with. To Gerda, the scene of middle-class German Jewish girls learning to cook as a means to leave Germany and find employment and visas abroad was comedic, worthy of a comedy sketch. Gerda, like a number of these women, arrived in places like the East End of London, where the poverty was something they had never seen before. It was primitive, Gerda explains. Adjusting to this landscape was particularly challenging, yet adjusting to being in a position of servitude and cooking and cleaning dishes in a home more familiar to their pre-war home lives was also a challenge. In one of Gerda's domestic jobs at Hitchingbrook House, which is an English stately home with a grandiose history attached to the Cromwell family and the Earl of Sandwich, she describes how pleasant it was to be in the presence of a strata I ordinarily wouldn't have met in London. So I went from Hoxton to nobility, she says. Ermgard Bloom is another example of this conflict between how they saw themselves as middle-class German Jews and found semi-comfort in being around such people, but they were viewed by those around them as merely servants. Ermgard received a domestic work visa as a housekeeper for Professor Norman Bentwich's Kent Cottage, which wasn't far from the Kitchener camp, of which he helped oversee. In one instance of hosting, she says, I pretended that these people were my guests, and I had it on a very elegant dressing gown. I baked cookies, and I had tea on a tray, and I went up to bring the lord and lady the tea and cookies, and they said, in future, you come in your uniform, not your dressing gown. Ermgard had acted like a middle-class German-Jewish hostess and was put in her place by the people she served. In America, domestic work was also a way for German-Jewish refugees to earn money and um, uh, obtain safe passage, although a visa programme specifically for such positions did not exist. When Lillian Friedman arrived in New York from Cuba, she undertook paid work to earn, to earn money. She did domestic work for a family in an, in an affluent part of the city. She describes her first um, night on the job. The first night when I was there, I had to roast a duck and I had to serve it, and they liked it, and the rest of the duck went in the refrigerator. I looked the next day, and it was still there, and I thought, I want so much to eat that duck, but I didn't dare. And the day after, I looked, and the duck was gone. I looked in the garbage, there was the duck. See, people were very careless with food. Anyway, from then on, I always asked if I could eat the rest of the food, and I had very good food. I had the same food that these people ate. Whilst being wasteful with, uh, with food was actually not really part of middle-class German Jews' pre-war life, since thrift and frugalness were actually markers of middle-class German identity, which historian Nancy Regan has written about, Lillian's wealthy hosts display their wealth through the apparent ease in binning the duck. Lillian, however, is stuck, str struggling with hunger and limited access to food in her new status as a German Jewish domestic worker and finds this behaviour most frustrating. Domestic work was a tough job for these women. Women. It involved long hours, intense lo loneliness, surly employers, limited food, and food they were not used to preparing. It was a low-status position that contrasted with their life, with life in their natal homes. The conditions meant many did not stay in their positions, seeking alternative work. This domestic paid work emphasises how class tensions were a potent part of the German Jewish experience. The employer had um, had become the employee. Um, to diverge slightly along this theme of domestic work, I would like to very quickly reference German Jewish men who were, who were part of some of these women's journeys as either husbands or fathers. Whilst my uh, main focus is women, I think to fully understand women's experiences, knowing how German Jewish men also interacted with food in these environments is important. Um, these women were, um, were often the family's financial provider in places abroad, which added a new status and class dynamic to the nuclear family. Many German Jewish men were unable to transfer their previous occupations um, uh, to the uh, pre-war and wartime job market. Many German Jewish men, uh, women had the double burden of taking care of the family finances through work and managing all the tasks attached to their household. In some cases, men took on the domestic role of cooking whilst their wives were at work. Lillian Friedman, who was earning money through domestic work, found that her husband struggled to find employment. My husband was so desperate, he said he's a failure. I said, you are not, and I encouraged him. Similarly, Ruth Windmuller describes how this loss of status was a particular blow to her parents when they moved to New York. For my parents, it must have been a lot harder to adjust because, again, we lived under Spartan circumstances. My mother cooked. But later on, my father cooked because he couldn't work. This was not what they'd been used to. Ellen Lorch says that her husband got used to having a wife who wasn't just home keeping house and cooking anymore. In fact, he learned to cook himself because he also wanted to eat. 
Women had to contend with multiple dualities. They were often primary breadwinners in jobs um, usually below their status, in addition, to having man in addition to having to manage duties at home while their partners struggled to adjust to their new situation. Although, as Ruth Windmuller and Ellen Lorch's testimonies demonstrate, some German Jewish men did take on cooking responsibilities whilst women worked, and so this is evidence of gender role reversals in these landscapes. So, for those seeking to secure emigration to America, Cuba was often a stepping stone, particularly when embassies closed, visa applications stalled, and a greater urgency was sensed that it was better to get out and figure out next steps away from Germany. Cuba looked like a fantasy, said survivor Erica Jacobs. The vibrant colours of the markets, cheap tropical produce and dreamy sunset vistas contributed to Erica's view of Cuba as this paradise. German Jewish women would do their grocery shopping, a bi -weekly, uh, shopping bi-weekly at fresh produce markets where three pineapples or mangoes cost 10 cents and three big avocados were 5 cents. The produce that was too expensive to purchase often included um, items key to their diets in Germany, like potatoes, which had to be imported, Cuba, which had a Jewish community as, as a result of a diamond industry that attracted European Jews to conduct business there, was, was climate-wise a, a tropical landscape with new foodstuffs to try, but with a Jewish community that had established roots. Ruth Bickhard's testimony is interesting evidence of this. Ruth arrived in Havana in 1939 with her mother, reuniting with her father who had arrived a year earlier after the November pogrom. She describes her first impressions of the Cuban capital. We had a beautiful apartment in the suburbs of Havana. If you look down from the apartment, you could see huts and see the differences between the haves and the have-nots. And although economically at this point we belong to the have-nots, culturally we belong to the haves. End of quote. And how does this relate to food? Well, Ruth's family would visit an American Jewish restaurant in downtown Havana that serviced the Jewish community. It was called Moishe Pipik. There was a familiarity with this space. It served as a space where their German Jewish identity would fit in. They were attended to by waiters on tablecloth tables and served traditional European Jewish cuisine um, like chicken soup, apple strudel, gefilte fish and herring, as well as dishes with a more Cuban inflection like arroz con pollo. And here is the dual language menu of the restaurant's offerings. And yet this experience of dining at Moshe Pipit was not quite the middle class cafe space Ruth expected. She says, we ate there, and I have to laugh about it. When we got there, the waiter flipped the tablecloth over to the other side, because the side that someone had gotten up from was dirty. So he just flipped it over to the other side. And when we looked around, we saw others using the tablecloth as napkins, because there were no napkins on the table. Culturally, they were German Jewish, and had at one time been used to immaculate surface with crisp white napkins and starched tablecloths. This is what they were expecting at Moshe Pipic, and yet it did not pan out as such. They had, to, they had the chance to consume familiar dishes, but the setting, whilst humorously described by Ruth, was not quite what they were expecting. With little financial means, they could afford the cafe's prices, but since they culturally resonated with the so-called haves of society, Moshe Pipic was a slight disappointment. In Cuba, most German Jewish emigres were, allowed, were not allowed to work. This made families' financial situation precarious. Most relied on aid organisations like the American Jewish Joint District Committee or, or the JDC, or most often relatives in the US who would send money every month to cover rent and food. Many out, rented out rooms in their Cuban apartments to bring in a little extra cash. Despite this, several testimonies have revealed that a number of German Jewish women still employed domestic help, although even this brought up the issue of class and status. Ingrid Altman's mother employed household help in her small Havana apartment. The interviewer asks, your mother resumed her previous lifestyle, and Ingrid responds, as well as she could. Ellen Lorch says, referring to her parents, that this was the first time in their lives that they did not have money at their disposal, and so they had to live frugally. Despite this, Ellen goes on to reveal that for a while, but not, uh, but not very long, they had a housekeeper, housekeeper in Cuba who came a few times a week to cook and clean. She was the wife of a doctor. In Germany, doctors were very venerated, and their wives were called Frau Doctor. My mother just couldn't take it. She could not have a doctor as a household helper. Germany was pretty classified, and my mother couldn't deal with it. She could not have a doctor as a servant. Ellen's testimony is quite explicit in this relationship between food, in this case cooking and managing a kitchen, and the German Jewish emigratory experience. There is a slightly funny tension here. Ellen's mother, who does not have disposable income, is still drawing on domestic help, as she did in her pre-war life as a German Jewish housewife in Dusseldorf, Yet due to her own predispositions on notions of class, status and hierarchy, 
She was unable to employ a doctor's wife as a cook and a household help, who is also a German Jewish woman trying to find her way in Cuba. Places like Cuba were also opportunities to begin making long-term plans for the future, as the United States um, was, often, um, was often the main goal. Um, food could be a way of establishing these roots, from learning to cook to feed families abroad, in addition to being the foundation of new businesses. Bianca Berger emigrated to Cuba in 1939 with her young family and moved into a boarding house where they would rent out the rooms and she would cook for the residents. She talks about Havana being the first real time she had to cook. She says, I started to cook. I couldn't really cook. I'm still not a good cook. It doesn't pay anymore. At that time, cooking was a means for Bianca to provide for her family in Cuba, but food in a different capacity actually became, an Im became very important to Bianca's life as a German Jewish emigre. The Berger family started a small clandestine business of selling candies. The Cuban authorities, with a little bribe, turned a blind eye to their entrepreneurial endeavours. This business was to become a, a more significant feature of the family's life as German Jewish emigres when they finally secured visas to move to New York in 1941. Within three months of being in New York, the Berger set up a tiny little candy store on Broadway. Their first shop was next to a butcher's, which Bianca hated because it made their sweet shop smell of meat. But after one and a half years, they could afford to move the store across the street, which Bianca describes as a real store. And I will return to Bianca Berger's story of the sweet shop later on. A more unusual um, refugee experience was that of the German Jewish settlers in the Dominican Republic. The country's dictator, Rafael Trio, permitted the JDC to set up a refugee agricultural settlement. The Dominican Republic Settlement Association, known as DORSA, was founded to finance the project. The settlement, situated on an abandoned banana plantation, comprised of ramshackle huts, lushes, tropical vegetation, and an eight-mile stretch of beach. Around 729 Jewish refugees lived there from 1940 to September 1947. Many of its residents were middle-class urbanites from Germany and Austria, who needed to learn the region's Spanish acquire farming skills, and climatise to a searing heat. Despite battles with the language, climate and new foodstuffs, Europe was vividly transplanted into the Caribbean, as Simone Gigliotti has written. German became the unofficial language, Viennese coffee houses sprung up, and cooperative production houses for meat processing and butter and cheese making overtook agriculture as the main fiscal output of the settlement. Law Gilbert's eight-hour testimony was an incredibly useful VHA resource for understanding and answering many of, my, uh, many of my research questions. Law's family, who were interned in the French internment camp of Gers at the base of the Pyrenees, were selected by Dorsa to be sent to the, refugee, uh, the Jewish refugee community in Sozoa. It was unusual to be selected as a family unit, as the point of the settlement um, was predominantly for young um, men and young women to um, form a successful settlement, basically. Um, um, but her parents were married and over the age of 40. Law's summary of Sozoa, even if it's slightly more nuanced than this, is as follows. Basically, the idea of the settlement was an experiment to see if people from middle-class Western Europe could manage physically in the tropics and live as farmers and adapt to the conditions. So how did German Jewish refugees transition from middle-class city dwellers to farmers on a distant Caribbean island? Firstly, the food in Sozoa was quite unlike anything they had eaten before. Many found that even the most basic foods that, had been that they had previously um, eat, um, eaten as everyday nourishment in their past were absent from the settlement's grocery store shelves. However, this also opened up the chance to try new foods that had hitherto been missing in Germany. Whilst tentativeness over unfamiliarity existed, uh, the lack of other options and indeed excitement at the chance to try new things created a culinary symbiosis between familiar and unfamiliar. The foodways of Sozoa were certainly novel, but acted as a bridge between uh, their old life in Germany and the new ones they were to carve out abroad. Law, sir, law says, they sold these big bananas and we said, oh my goodness, we had never seen such big bananas. Aren't they wonderful? So we bought some and when we started eating them, they didn't taste like bananas. They were plantains, but we didn't know that, and we ate them raw. What strange tasting bananas they were. They became one of my favourite foods, cooked or baked, of course. Mangoes, pineapples, coconuts, and tropical vegetables like pigeon peas also became central to their Sozoan diets. The women in the homestead, um, using such ingredients, worked in the communal kitchens, of which there were two, one kosher or one, um, and one non-kosher. 
and class is an interesting frame of analysis in Sosoa. I will now quote Law's testimony, and whilst she is very gracious about the native Dominicans, please be aware of the somewhat colonial framework that is apparent in the social structure of um, Sosoa. Law says, Many of the upper-class Dominicans are very proud of their Jewish heritage. There were quite a few Maranos, which referred to the Spanish and Portuguese Jews who converted to Christianity during the Inquisition um, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, uh, that, that ended up in the Caribbean, and some people trace their Jewish heritage, and they're very proud of that. That was the upper classes. But the native people were just dirt poor, and those are the people that we, we were dealing with. The poverty was incredible, but they have an inner charm and a wonderful hospitality. When these settlers arrived, a sort of hierarchy developed or was possibly re-established. Law's mother had a domestic helper who was a native Dominican woman. These German Jews were arriving in, in an unfamiliar environment, environment, but quickly made adjustments to their cultural setting, in turn contributing to um, this sort of hierarchical um, structure. Um, from novel foodstuffs and class structures, for observant Jews, keeping kosher was a particular challenge in such landscapes. It does not appear too frequently in the testimonies I consulted, but Regina Weiss's testimony does emphasise how challenging emigration foodscapes were for observant Jewish families. New York and Britain, even Cuba to an extent because of a history of German-Jewish um, migration to the country, all had continental stores that sold kosher produce. Thus, it was easier to continue observing Jewish food customs in these spaces. Sozoa, on the other hand, was very different. When Regina Weiss and her family arrived in Sozoa and stayed with a man who was a shochet, which was a person officially certified to slaughter according to Jewish law, and provided them with, with a kosher meal, he told the family that there was, that there was no Yiddishkeit in Sozoa, and Yiddishkeit, uh, which literally means Jewishness, refers to those practising the Jewish way of life and its customs. The Shuchek informed the family that he had instructed one settler to slaughter kosher chickens. So as Regina says, the family thought, at least there'll be chickens. On the first morning, her father saw the Shuchek shaving himself with a knife, which is strictly forbidden. And that was the end of our chickens, no more chicken. My father wasn't going to eat from him. If he's not an observant Jew, my father wasn't going to eat. Whilst Regina and her mother also did not eat the chickens, instead having fish and vegetables, it was under her father's instruction that the so-called kosher chicken was off limits. In my larger research, I have observed how food and gender plays out in the ghettos and camps when it comes to levels of religious observance, with practicing Jewish men more likely to reject food of non-kosher origin, whereas women were uh, more likely to forgo eating kosher in order to consume, f consume food in a landscape of starvation. Another instance of this in the emigratory context again involves Regina Weiss's parents. This time her mother actually intervened. Her father um, was in a hospital for tuberculosis and he refused to eat for fear he was being served non-kosher food. Regina's mother implored her, him to eat, but he refused. So she sent a letter to his cousins in the United States, who were very religious, to have them send word that he needed to eat non-kosher. They said, it is more of a sin for him not to eat and not to heal than for him to eat kosher and not get well. It was Regina's mother who ensured that her husband would get better, even if it meant breaking his dedication to the laws of Kashrut. She employed Piokak Nefesh, which is a Jewish law that states the preservation of life overrides virtually any other religious rule of Judaism. So technically, Regina's mother was acting in a more religiously orthodox manner than her husband. Nevertheless, this example is another instance of how religious observance, food and gender, has an interesting relationship in the Holocaust. These refugee journeys were not easy. Whilst they were escaping further persecution and possible deportation, the experience of migration was a constant challenge. So how did these traumas and challenging experiences impact the way these women lived their lives in their new homes? The journey affected Ruth Windmuller, who was asked by the interviewer, did you experience um, during the war affect the way you raised your children? Ruth responds, well, yes, the way I raised my children and still my outlook, we are very frugal, even when we don't have to be. Food, I cannot waste food. I would eat from my children's plate if they didn't finish. To throw food in the garbage, I just couldn't do it. So they make fun of me now, and they used to call me Mother the Garbage Pail. I guess having been taken out of very comfortable surroundings left a mark. My daughter has rebelled against us. She's comfortably off and indulges. Again, we see how Ruth's middle-classness is a frame of reference she returns to. I guess, having been taken out of my comfortable surroundings, left a mark. Her actions around food has also had a direct effect on her daughter's behaviour, who acts in a manner completely contrasting to her mother. 
Here, Holocaust emigratory food scapes has, has had an influence even on the second generation. Another Ruth, Ruth Bickhart, also highlights the idea of class, food, and post-war behaviour. After Cuba, she moved to New York, becoming more religious, and moving to Tel Aviv for a few months, where she learned to cook on a kibbutz. She says, I grew up as a very privileged child, and if the Holocaust hadn't come along, I probably would have been moulded into something much more ladylike. In these testimonies, we can see how food, class, and emigration are very entangled, and have influenced and informed these German Jewish women's post-war lives. The majority of this lecture focus has been on German Jewish women who emigrated before the outbreak of war. However, a few testimonies consulted for other aspects of my research during my residency here have reaped interesting conclusions about how traumatic Holocaust experiences, particularly involving the lack of food, starvation and inedibility, affected and influenced German Jewish women's post-war emigratory experiences. And I'd like to share a few examples. Gertrude Mainzer experienced Westerbork transit camp and Bergen-Belsen concentration camp of which she describes the terrible food and effort it took to get their daily allotment of watery soup. She says, referring to Belson, I hated standing in line for food. This is something she has taken into the post-war, in her, into her post-war life in, in the United States. She continues saying that even when I now go to a party, I have somebody else get me a plate. I don't stand in line. Hilda Stern made it to the United States in 1947 having experienced the terrible conditions of the Vrudge Ghetto and Auschwitz. She describes her parenting in the post-war world. My parents were very strict. I was much stricter. If they wouldn't eat their food at lunchtime, I would heat it up for dinner. And if they wouldn't eat it for dinner, I would heat it up for breakfast. She describes being strict like this out of love. I wanted them to be strong. I saw how so many people just couldn't take it. The food was not what we were used to. We were kind of spoiled. Her traumatic experiences with Holocaust foodscapes shaped how she mothered her children, hating food waste and not allowing them to be fussy about food, which can all be linked back to the terrible food waste she endured in the two dreadful environments of Virgin Auschwitz. At the end of the statement, this thread of class is again palpable as she mentions being spoiled. Her parents were not strict, as strict. They had always eaten well, allowed her to be a fussy child. They had been middle-class German Jews. Yet in her post-war life, she cannot parent like this. Food for her is something she wants her own. She doesn't want her own children to turn their noses up at. She provides her family with a lot of good food, a uh, lot of food, all good food, but won't let her won't let things go to waste. Having experienced intense and debilitating hunger during the war, she does not want her children to take this for granted. This notion of being preoccupied with hunger is even evidenced in her interaction with the interviewer and videographer. During the setting up of tape two, Hilda addresses the videographer, saying, this poor man must be hungry, and I have grapes and stuff. If you eat bagels, I do have some. I have some bagels and cream cheese and locks in the refrigerator. During the offering, the crew are talking between themselves and largely ignore her hospitable offer, but she keeps coming back to offering food. She offers food again when the third tape is being set up. So... For the final part of the lecture, I would like to dedicate some time to the work I did in the special collections. One thing that did draw me um, to do research here were the private papers of the German Jewish emigres Leon and Martha Fuchtwanger. Leon and Martha Fuchtwanger were bourgeois mm. Munich born Jews who were part of the literary and artistic circles of pre war Europe. They spent a lot of time in North Africa, Italy, and France, which is where they were when Vichy France sent a number of Jews to internment camps. They managed to escape the southern French internment camps and travel to Portugal, where they each boarded separate ships to New York. In 1941, the Fuchtwangers moved to Los Angeles, where a large number of European intellectuals and artists were taking up residence. Their entire personal archive was bequeathed to the University of Southern California, and I was particularly intrigued to see if food was part of this vast archival collection. But I, I wasn't sure if I would find anything of note for my research, but I did. Um, so searching key terms like cookbooks and recipes did not reap any results in Martyr's papers. Instead, I searched things like personal ephemera, personal manuscripts and scrapbooks in the hopes that there could possibly be something useful there. In one scrapbook, there were many invitations to dinners, many of which were formal. And one stood out, though, and it's on the screen now. Um, a jolly cherubic figure invites Martyr to come eat, drink and be merry. Um, in Leon's papers, a search for a recipe resulted in an apple strudel recipe of Martyr's, and it must have been particularly good as a folder is dedicated to it in one of um, his many archival boxes. The filling calls for a fully homemade concoction. It begins, you can use apple sauce in cans, but it will be a little too runny and you'll have to mix in cracker crumbs warmed in butter. 
In the folder is the hand-drafted version of the recipe, which appears to have been written on scrap pieces of paper from one of Leon's manuscripts. This is followed by the typed-out instruction for the strudel and the filling. In Marta's papers, there are numerous transcripts and manuscripts about different aspects of their life as exiles. In an oral history transcript, we learn about their adventurous trips around North Africa and Italy in the 1910s and 20s, where they lived in, and I quote, relative poverty, as bohemian travellers where they, they sampled delicious fresh, fresh produce in elegant places like Capri. We also learn about the community of German-speaking exiles they were part of in Los Angeles. There are countless references to glamorous dinner parties, where things like lobster and avocado were served, a combination enjoyed by the Fruchtwangers before it became popular, and Marta is, clean, uh, is um, keen to stress this in the testimony. The Fruchtwangers would spend New Year with Charlie Chaplin and Christmas at the Brex, a couple they knew from Germany, where they eat goose and miracarp. This Christmas tradition was something the Fruchtwangers transplanted from their lives in Germany into their new life in L.A. Leon Fruchtwanger's personal papers supports this picture of their rather glamorous life where food is part of the story. There are, there are guest lists to teas and dinners posted by the Fruchtwangers, and Chaplin is the name on one, uh, on one of these. There were also receipts from a two-month stint in New York in 1947, where they stayed at the Sherry Netherland Hotel on Fifth Avenue, a five-star establishment for society's elite. There are eight invoices from the Sherry Wine and Spirits Company, a few orders for the rather expensive and luxury champagne houses of Bollinger and Verve Clicquot. There is another um, folder dedicated to food items like duck. It also includes letters of interest for things like Scotch grouse, which is not the famous whiskey but the game bird, and German wine, which the Fruchtwangers are informed they cannot obtain because the French army has confiscated it and denied it being exported. And I'm sure there's something to be said about diplomacy and wine heritage um, with the French army confiscating German wine, um, especially as the letter goes on to inform Leon that there is a whole host of French wines he can purchase. <laughs> the archival collection is full of animated and entertaining descriptions of the Fruchtwangers' lives from bourgeois German Jews to bohemian European travellers to famous Los Angeles residents with connections across the artistic spectrum and a food scene to match. In one box dedicated to Marta's personal ephemera, I found a clipping from a November 1959 edition of Aufbau. Aufbau was a periodical founding in, founded in 1934 in New York City as a newspaper for German Jewish immigrants. The clipping I found was from their Thanksgiving edition, and across each side there were adverts and articles about food, including one about turkey and cranberries, which talks about the historic relationship on Thanksgiving tables about turkey and cranberry sauce. There are countless adverts for chocolate and sweet shops that sell kosher and parv treats. I'm not sure what to make of this newspaper, um, but to take you back to a VHA testimony, I find it even more interesting. Remember Bianca Berger, who sold clandestine candies in Cuba and then opened up a candy store on Broadway with her husband? Well, they would sometimes advertise their chocolate and alphabet. It was a way to spread the word about their delicious treats. And lo and behold, there is an advert for A, referring to Alfred, Bianca's husband, Berger's Broadway store. They advertise the most exquisite delicacies, including gingerbread, fruit and marzipan cake, hailing from Lower Silesia, honey slices, spiced cakes from Aiken, delicacies from Basil, and many others. Bianca goes on to say in her testimony how a lot of past acquaintances and friends from Germany found them again through these advertisements in Aufbau. The store became hugely popular in her um became hugely popular, and in her testimony she, she describes them making marzipan at Christmas that filled the street with a sweet smell that caused huge queues and gatherings outside the door. The Burgers candy store became a hub for German Jews. As Bianca said, it was a place where, where everyone met, where German Jews who couldn't speak English yet, and they had so many worries, they came in, the even, they came in the evening to meet in our little store and talk everything over. It was like a family house. For displaced, even homesick Jews, familiar foods provided a comfort and connection to home. Urban pockets from Jews from earlier migrations had created a lively culinary scene of kosher butchers, delis and continental stores that would sell foodstuffs recognisable to German Jews. This is where the Burgers stores, uh, this is where the Burger store, which sold traditional German kuchen from different regions, fit in. The store was a quintessential German Jewish store transplanted into the bustle of New York City. It was so German that their teenage daughter Inga found a, job, found, a, found a job in another candy store in the Bronx to learn, and I quote, the American way of making candy. 
Bianca describes how we had a European way. We were connected with our German people and our European people, and she wanted to see how it was done the other way round. Both Bianca and Inga were forging their way in their new lives as middle-class German Jewish women thrust from their home via Cuba to New York City. Bianca stuck to her German Jewish identity, whilst Inga sought out the American culture she was going to grow up in. In consulting the Alphabet archival records, which are digitised, I found the article interested to contextualise the two pages in the wider publication. Marta's cutting came from a 36-page edition where food, adverts, food or adverts for grocery stores are not mentioned again. Additionally, there are numerous other newspaper articles in her personal collection, but these I have found so far are all about her um, or interviews she's had with journalists. Um, um, whereas this newspaper clipping um, has absolutely nothing to do with her. Um, so why did she choose to keep a page, um, page of adverts for predominantly New York-based German Jewish food stores? Um, of course, we might never know why Marta kept this cutting, but it is fascinating to hear another survivor talk about these adverts that I found in the special collections of um, another German Jewish emigre. And finally, just to conclude, whilst German Jewish refugee experience may occupy a great deal of space um, in the scholarship, food's relationship to such narratives is often only a footnote. However, food, its absence or abundance, its sourcing and preparation, its distribution and consumption, its digestion and indigestion are all familiar to human experience and form many of our enduring memories. In a period of intense food paucity, persecution and mass migration, food and consumption were indelibly tapestried into the life of these German Jewish refugees, which this lecture I hope has sought to emphasise. This lecture has also wanted to reveal the challenges of moving from a bourgeois existence to one more impoverished, where interactions with food and domestic work highlighted this acute shift. Not every interaction with food in this context can of course be linked with class, however a common theme in the testimonies and something that I hope I have successfully shown today is how food production, domestic work and food in the process of settling into a new life abroad can be analysed in conjunction with German Jewish women's relationship to their middle class identity. And so at that, I thank you for listening and welcome your questions. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Thank and you. I'm very aware that we're, most of us are eating while listening oh, yeah. to this <laughs> lecture about food. So, um, yeah, we have about 25 minutes for questions. If you could stop sharing yes. your screen. Um, for those of you on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature, and um, my colleague Maya will read uh, as many questions as time allows. And if you are comfortable just calling yeah, okay. on people. Yeah, fine. I'll start with Paul. Okay, thank you so much uh, for this really interesting presentation. Um, so I was wondering, when you have these three parts, the UK, and then you focus on Cuba, and then uh, at the end in uh, the US, um, and also the Abosur Sosua, um, the last three, you had places where people met and bonded over food. But you didn't have this for the UK because your focus was much more on domestic mm -hmm. work instead of food. And so I wonder. Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, is, are there similar places like the coffee shops in Sosua or the, the, the candy store in New York? Then also, let's say in London, where people gather and bond over food yeah. as in their immigrant experience. Yes, that's a great question. Um, yes, um, I actually now you say that I realise I do focus a bit on um, just the domestic work visa, whereas obviously there's a more uh, more I could say about the experience of emigration to Britain of German Jewish women who didn't come on these visas and came joining families and things like that, and coffee shops and cafes. Um, do feature in testimonies. In other sources I have outside of the VHA testimonies, um, there's lots of um, reference to Leon's Tea House, which was a chain of tea houses in Britain, and um, a lot of, uh, well, a number of memoirs and um, other testimonies I consult do talk about meeting people there or um, visiting these British um, sort of cafe houses. Um, but predominantly, in the work I've done exclusively with the VHA, um, meeting people in sort of food scapes, whether that's a cafe or a coffee house, um, has been more of a feature for the other, um, for the United States, um, Cuba and um, Suzoa um, that I found anyway. Um, 
the I didn't get to speak about it um, in this lecture, but there's a lot of um, uh, there's been a few testimonies I've consulted where um, women have met their German Jewish women have met their future husbands at coffee shops in um, New York City, where they um, so the, these sort of spaces are also important for like the longevity of um, their lives abroad. Um, so yes, I definitely say the cafe culture of Britain and other foodscapes in Britain is not something that will be absent from my general thesis, but um, for the work I've done, um, it's not as it hasn't featured as much as the other other spaces. So can I add something? Yes. So I want to push you a little bit more because uh, what I heard from your presentation in Sosua and in New York, they bond over the food which they had yes. made from home. Oh yes, yes. And this is different from going to a British tea house. Oh yeah, yes, okay. I yeah, I understand. Um, so in Britain, these sort of spaces were not um, as Jewish cafes or kosher delicatessens or continental stores were not as common in Britain, even in London, even though there'd been a Jewish community in like the East End of London. Um, there was sort of a lack of Jewish foodscapes in um, London, which meant German Jewish women refugees often created their own sort of communal gatherings. And I have found that in a VHA testimony where um, uh, a, a German Jewish woman who had come with her daughter who was on a domestic work visa, but she wasn't on a domestic work visa. Um, and she created like this coffee group um, where they would eat uh, cake and tea um, with other German Jewish refugees. Um, so yes. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for this talk. Um, thank you. I just have two questions, I guess, on thinking about um, your experience in the archives. So one, thinking about how many testimonies Please. you were able to find um, and thinking about the where they're coming from in Germany. So are there any city, cities that stand out as being more common for um, these testimonies that are focusing on food? Mm -hmm. And then also just wondering more about the demographic, like age-wise, mm -hmm. because the, for the, the, in the example of the domestic work, mm -hmm. these as you know, under 45, but then thinking about the, um, if there's specific age range that you are focusing mm -hmm. on, or if you're just trying to um, get a better picture at, yeah. That's Great. Um, so the, uh, in the Visual History Archives, I consulted about um, 60 testimonies that were split between the uh, four landscapes I was looking at and a few others um, not related to this, specific, uh, specifically to emigration. Um, and um, I found researching Cuba, Suzoa, and I mean the United States comes up so frequently in the testimonies that that's also not an issue, but Cuba and Suzoa were easier to search because if it's mentioned in a testimony, chances are they've been or they were there. Although for Cuba, sometimes Cuba's mentioned if they were on some of the ill-fated ships like the St. Louis, who was turned back. Um, um, whereas with, with Britain, and because I was also very interested in this domestic work visa, I really struggled finding that search. So um, I spoke to Crispin um, the end of last week, so he's given me more search terms I can use. So I will be doing that when I get back to Britain. Um, so searching for this domestic work visa was a bit more sort of challenging in the VHA testimonies. In terms of the cities or the like sort of places they're coming from, it, I mean there's a range, um, you know, Dusseldorf, Munich, Hamburg all feature. Berlin is probably the biggest and um, it had, uh, a lot of the German metropolises had sort of um, Jewish communities but Berlin was probably one where the middle-class German Jews, at least, there was a um, large community. Vienna's the same. Um, and then age demographic, that's a really good question. So with the domestic work visa, predominantly they are, I mean, young, right? They were um, late, um, late teens, early 20s. And so with those sort of domestic um, work visas, my demographic is quite young, but they often refer to their mothers if they came over with them, who, um, so in the instance I was just saying about the the, the mother who had this little like tea, um, tea group with other German Jewish refugees. Um, uh, she was obviously a, a lot um, older and created other ways where she interacted with the British foodscape, whereas her daughter was a domestic worker and a cook in a family. Um, so, um, 
yes, the demographic question is a difficult one because it's like I would like to, predominantly it's younger women who end up being part of these emigratory foodscapes, or especially they're at least part of the archives, uh, the VHA archives. Um, um, a lot of parents sent their young children, and I don't just mean like on the kinder transport, but I mean just like teenage children or uh, like their young um, children um, on um, uh, on these journeys where they stayed at home and then ended up perishing in the Holocaust or coming out later um, when a war's over. Um, so, yes, is that okay? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, Ali. Uh, thank you so much for your Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I just have one quick comment and then a question. Yeah. Uh, so first, um, when you were mentioning, of for example, going to Cuba and mm -hmm. uh, the Dominican Republic, I remember this one testimony that I think it would be perfect for you. Um, it's on Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. but it's okay. by Rabbi um, mm -hmm. Salman Shakhtar Shalomim. And he also has a, he also mentions that in his memoir, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's quite prominent that he describes coming to Puerto Rico and yeah. not having any kosher food. Yes. And he goes, and he goes, we were not able to get anything. We only had bananas. So we were only going to eat for two weeks, not some bananas. So I think that was, when you were talking, I kept thinking about that stuff. I think that could also yeah, fantastic. be useful for you too. Um, and then in regards to Gua, I had a quick mm -hmm. question because, um, of course, with Sosua, there, was a, there wasn't really a Jewish community, as you mentioned, but in Cuba, there was already, as you also said, there was already an established one. And I know the Jewish community in Cuba was different from the one that was also common. I mean, there were some, yes. um, they were helpful, but at the same time, they had their own yeah. conflicts in between them. And I was wondering, when you're talking about food and this romanticization that they had with Cuba, did the existing Jewish community help them in regards to getting a in regards to getting, for example, a kosher food, or just in that relationship of adapting to Cuba during the mm -hmm. transitional time that they were going to be there, or how was that experience over for you? Mm -hmm. That's another great question. Um, I have an example for that with a with a uh, with a Jewish. Um, he might have been German, but a Jewish emigre who arrived in Cuba way before um, 1930s, uh, the 1930s, in a memoir of a woman called Elsa Gerstel, who describes her career as a cook beginning in Cuba. She was an absolutely awful cook in Germany and her mother even warned her future son-in-law that um, her, her daughter couldn't cook. So basically don't marry her because she can't cook. But then in Cuba, she started on this career of being a cook and a um, Jewish um, uh, emigre to Cuba pre the 1930s um, was, the, um, was her cookery teacher basically in Cuba. Um, I haven't found it in the VHA testimonies, but I'm sure there are those sorts of relationships and more uh, that they, they are, I'm sure those relationships were there. Um, interviewers don't tend to ask those kind of things, so it's uh, sometimes difficult to uh, grasp all the nuances of the relationships and the tensions between these different groups. Because um, in Sozoa there were tensions between the Austrian and German Jews who arrived um, on the settlement. So you had Viennese coffee houses but there'd be tensions between German Jews going to these Viennese coffee houses. So um, uh, those sort of relationships are also very apparent in the, uh, uh, in the material. Um, was there another part of the question that you wanted oh, to ask? Uh, no, yeah, that's yeah, it. Is yeah, that okay? Yeah. yeah. Charlotte. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of technical questions, but um, in what ways were the shifts um, in the space on the ships that the migrants took, they also be considered emigration free states, and do these travel free states also make visible anything more about the past than German Jewish Muslims? Thank you for asking that question. That's um, a really interesting one. I would have liked to have spoken by enough time about the journeys um, that these um, German Jews took as to get from A to B. They obviously had long and difficult journeys on trains and vessels. Um, and it's the vessels that really do sort of speak in the testimonies of um, the way that food is then part of this, like the start of their journey abroad. They experience the food on the ships. And um, particularly for going to Cuba, um, it's very interesting, especially with this relationship to class, because a lot of them bought first class tickets. Um, and they had to buy a return ticket, but they'd buy the first class ticket to get to Cuba and then buy a third uh, class return. But obviously they weren't expecting to return, so um, so that was okay. Um, and many of you will probably be familiar with the voyage of the St. Louis, which set sail for Havana in 
1930, May 1939, um, but wasn't allowed to dock, and then about um, just over 900 passengers, most the majority of them, um, were Jews, were sent back to Europe. Um, and one testimony I consulted with the VHA talks about um, this choosing the St. Louis as the ship they're going to take, um, where they would they had the option to board a ship earlier, uh, the week earlier, but they chose the St. Louis because they wanted to travel first class. And then she goes on to describe how fantastic the meals are. They had cheese boards and appetizers and all this delicious food. And their middle class kind of identity as wanting to travel first class had stopped from going a week earlier. They would have got safe passage to Cuba at that point, but they chose the St. Louis because they wanted to travel first class. Um, um, and then other, other testimonies also talk about kind of this luxurious journey on the St. St. Louis, um, where the food was excellent. One woman even talks about gaining weight on the ship because the food was so good. But then you also have others talking about seasickness and then not being able to keep down food. But um, um, the journeys and the, the vessels are, I think, I think per, uh, important emigratory foodscapes in this context. Um, outside of Cuba, I also found some of these journeys um, on the boats to Cuba, Sozoa, um, the United States end up stopping in places like Casablanca or um, um, Algiers and other like French internment camps in Martinique or um, at the base of the Atlas Mountains. And there are often references um, to food in these places, particularly Casablanca. Um, a lot of testimony, uh, the, the three testimonies I consulted that talk about going via Casablanca, all every single one of them remembers the oranges they bought from the Casablanca. Um, market vendors whilst on board the ship um, and there's uh, a little bit of a sad instance where the where this uh, where the survivors talking about the buying these oranges and then the interviewer like cuts her off and then asks oh what was the name of the boat and she wants to continue talking about oranges and then she ends up going back probably 20 minutes later to go back to talking about the oranges that she bought from the um from the Casablancans so I think that these vessels and these um, um, these spaces are very important parts of this sort of emigration um, emigration journey and can also be seen as um, foodscapes. Yes, Maya? Yes, uh, so I have a question uh, in the Zoom uh, yes. from an attendee called Bettina Grant. And uh, Bettina asks, does you have work address the crucial role of food processing that was being sensed during the Holocaust years and during the immediate post-war years? transnational family and other networks that made this possible? Yes, yeah, so the work I've done in the VHA uh, this uh, month, I haven't specifically looked at the spaces where food parcels were sort of part of these um, uh, part of these experiences, but food parcels absolutely feature in testimonies about the ghettos, not about the, not about the concentration camps as much, although in France, if you were, there was a Jews were not allowed to receive parcels in concentration camps largely and um, but when there was a um, action um, for Jews to be sent to French internment camps from um, a specific region in Germany um, prior to sort of the mass deportations to um, uh, get to the ghettos and within the French internment camps they could receive parcels and a lot of them talk about these being lifelines and um, um, sort of a way for them to sustain themselves in these spaces where starvation and inedibility and unpalatability are so um, are such the like the um, sort of omnipresent feeling of the foodways of these spaces. Um, but specifically about the VHA testimonies, food parcels, um, I haven't found too much about it in like women or. Um, women in these emigratory landscapes sending parcels back to Europe. I haven't actually uh, found that um, in the testimonies I've consulted. Um, and I could talk about food parcels, but without consulting my notes from other chapters, um, I won't say any more on that, if that's okay. <laughs> yes? Um, I wanted to bring up maybe another sort of spot on the food journeys that might be worth focusing on. Yep. You, you draw a contrast between these middle-class German women who have a particular relationship with food, and then they get dropped down to class level or two, and mm -hmm. sort of rearrange their relationship with food. But there's an intermediary stage for some of these women who have enough time to know that they're going to be going to, to Britain. Um, and sometimes they'll take crash courses in English, for mm -hmm. but sometimes they also take 
uh, vocational training mm -hmm. in food prep. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to know if you looked into that sort of stage of the yep. journey. Because in some cases, it's not quite just being dropped into the middle of the Yes, yeah. No, absolutely. That's actually a really good point. And I think one testimony I did mention in this um, sort of talks about that, where the uh, girls would be sent to a like a cooking school prior to be sent uh, prior to gaining these domestic work visas. And um, a lot of um, testimonies outside the VHA, uh, like in memoirs and stuff I've consulted, talk about how women who weren't very good cooks end up taking on. Uh, end up doing courses in chocolate making, baking, um, gastronomy, other kind of cooking skills, because they think they'll be able to like use that as an employment skill um, in places abroad. So yes, you do have women, some German Jewish, middle class German Jewish women making conscious efforts to obtain culinary skills to be able to transplant into their lives abroad, which they hope will allow them to sort of, um, you're right, have this kind of intermediary stage between their middle classness and then completely dropping off from being uh, and arriving in a completely um, sort of separate position. Um, so that's a, a really, really good point and is absolutely something I um, look at um, in um, other uh, in the other like other material that I have. So thank you. Yes. Have you looked at all at women who ended up in the United States in somewhat more Somewhat smaller and more remote communities. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly of my wife and my grandmothers. One ended up in Cleveland and the other in Columbus, and their experiences are different, but interesting. Yes, that's a, 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 another great question. Um, so, predominantly, the places that I've found with the VHA testimonies or the, the the interviews I've chosen to consult because of maybe their journeys from Cuba or um, Sozoa or even Great Britain a lot move from Great Britain to the United States after doing these domestic work visas after the war and largely you have sort of the bigger cities being part of these women's journeys there have been a few more sort of um, remote communities I'm not as good on American geography and part of my work in when I come to write this chapter will be about sort of maybe focusing in on some of the, the like the uh, American um, uh, landscapes I want to specifically look at. New York is obviously one of the biggest ones. Um, so I don't have an answer to that question now in terms of the work I've done in the VHA testimonies, but there would be something I'm sure to be said about the experience of food in some of these places. Um, I think I possibly have to consult some notes, so maybe it's something I could talk to you afterwards. I think one testimony I did consult for this, where they moved to New York, but then moved out of New York because they couldn't afford to live in New York, and they thought moving to um, a more sort of rural location would be a better way of them being able to afford to um, afford to live, um, um, has featured. In terms of them describing like New York foodways compared to the foodways of the new place they're at, hasn't really sort of come up, but um, it would be something I would be interested to sort of look at. Um, so thank you for that question, and I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but I think there would be something to be said about these different um, communities and the different sort of foodscapes of these communities. Well, there's a question in okay. the um, Q&A that is not exactly on target with your research because it's asking about Austrian Jewish women and kind of comparisons between them. But I think, and it's from Uta Gordon, who is an incredibly um, knowledgeable uh, indexer for the Shoah Foundation and has probably watched more testimonies than anyone besides Kristen or maybe they watch the same. <laughs> Um, but it does raise an interesting question in your research when you're looking at their arrival in these new places, um, being able to distinguish between what's a German Jewish women's experience versus the um, people who've come from other countries. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with the challenges of disentangling uh, what's German Jewish versus other countries and the sources that you are working with? That's another good question. Um, and I do sometimes consult Austrian, uh, like it comes up, so it's Austrian, German, uh, Austrian, German, Austrian Jew Jewish women. Um, are not necessarily part of my source base, but I have consulted them in sort of this, uh, 
in within this research and um Austrian Jewish women were also sort of part of a similar sort of middle class um, um, society as their German Jewish counterparts. Um, so I've not necessarily found any um, challenges or differences between those two groups. Um, like I was mentioning about Suzoa, German and Austrian Jews, there was tension between the two of them in Suzoa. Um, and that's also interesting in itself. Um, interesting in itself. Um, in terms of looking at other Jewish demographics like Polish Jews or Czechoslovakian Jews or um, uh, other Jewish European Jewish communities that also experienced the Holocaust and also um, possibly emigration, it's not something I have looked at. It's something I consider possibly like methodologically, but it's not something that I uh, consider in this context. Obviously, German Jews who emigrated pre-war were emigrating from anti-Semitic decrees, whereas when you have the outbreak of war, it's it, these women in other European countries have not necessarily had that time or forethought to emigrate because they've not been living through um, several years of anti-Semitic decrees. Um, so again, I'm sure there would be a PhD in comparing German Jewish women's relationship with food and Polish German Jewish. Uh, sorry, I keep saying German Jewish, Polish Jewish women's relationship with food, and I'm sure there'd be something to say about that, um, especially within sort of more orthodox um, uh, Jewish circles in Poland, and there'd be a comparison and um, um, a project in that looking at how religious observance and food um, is part of um, these other um, Jewish groups within um, Europe. All right, I think we're going to conclude, so join me. <laughs>